depression is probably one of the things I've been talking about for the longest time and it's still one of the, my favorites to talk about. I think probably because it's very common. Um, the World Health Organization invariably over the last 15 years has declared depression to be the cause of more disability in North America than any other medical illness. So you can see that it's a very common illness and it hurts a lot of people. I think it's a pretty easy illness to understand really and yet uh, you know it's still pretty poorly understood in many circles and we find you know that we simply have to keep going with these educational things which uh, have been very helpful. So having said that uh, I'm going to try and do this in about an hour which will leave us about half an hour to have some questions. If you have some questions you feel you absolutely can't wait till the end you're welcome to interrupt me but I think it would go a little more smoothly if we could keep questions to the end. And then if there's time permitting, I'll I usually try and hang around for a little while later. So if people have questions and they'd like to talk to me on a more sort of personal one-to-one -one thing, I'll hang around for a bit. So having said that, I think I'll begin. So one of the things about depression, I think, that makes it very confusing and difficult for people to understand is that the word itself is used for a lot of different things. So. If you look outside of the world of medicine, psychiatry, and mental health, everybody uses the word, and most of us uh, would talk about depression in various ways. So a few weeks ago, somebody ran into my car, and I was quite upset, and I would have considered myself quite depressed for the afternoon, and you're cl clearly using the word differently than what doctors might use it for. Running around the hospital, I see a lot of people that have cancer, that have thyroid disorder and depression is one of their symptoms. So depression is a, use, is a word that's used to describe an emotion that we all have that has nothing to do with medicine or psychiatry. It's used to describe a symptom of a lot of different illnesses. And then ultimately what we're here to talk about tonight is depression as a disease. So in our world of psychiatry, we refer to depression or mood disorders typically as a major depressive episode, which is mostly what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So you can sort of see really then where the confusion comes in and that the term is used to mean different things. So it kind of gets us off to a bad start. So it would have been wiser, I think, if some bright guy would have come up with a fancy name for it a long time ago because this makes, it adds to the confusion. So, and I think the biggest thing really, the slide, the topic on, what the, what the slide has to say is the issue that I, wrestle with and talk to people about almost every day of my working life, I think, where people, there are people out there that can't seem to get their heads past the point that depression is often considered to be some kind of personality flaw or a weakness. Or if you come home and say, I went to my doctor today and the doctor says that I'm depressed and then you have a spouse or a partner thinking, well, why would the doctor say that? If you just try harder, you would do better and you don't really, why are they calling it an illness? So there's this never-ending seeming confusion around is this something that people could deal with easily by putting in a bit of effort? Is it just some kind of flaw in people's character or is it a disease? So there's been this very long-standing myth out there that depression is a personality weakness, that it just represents people that aren't good people, aren't strong people, aren't trying hard enough or don't get it, when really the reality is it's a very complicated neurobiological disease. So, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight is this illness called depression. So one of the things I should tell you just to start with is I've tried to make this talk not full of some confusing slides because there's been some confusion go on in the last few months in that in psychiatry we have a textbook called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders or Disease and it's just undergone a new revision. So in the latest textbook, which has just kind of arrived in people's offices in the last month or two, there's some changes. So I kind of had to think a little bit about how I was going to talk about depression tonight because some of the issues around depression diagnostic criteria about how we diagnose it, how we envision it, have changed a little bit. So I'm going to talk mostly about how we have done it for the last 10 years with our last edition of this diagnostic manual. But I'll point out before the evening is over what little things have changed so that we not only understand what we've been hearing about depression for the last decade, but I'll sort of bring you up to date around what we're gonna start hearing before too terribly long when people get used to this new manual. So we have a new manual that sort of redefines some of the aspects of depression. It'll be probably a year before it's 
energetically being used by most of us. So there's a bit of confusion out there, and hopefully I won't add to it. So why do people get depressed? There's, there has been a long-standing belief out there, or knowledge, I guess, that a lot of people have an inherited form of depression. So this disease of depression in its purest form is probably best described as an inherited predispos pre predisposition to depression. So we see people who seem to have depression running through their family, and what the geneticists tell us is not that people are born with a depressive illness, but rather that they're, they're born with a susceptibility or a greater likelihood to develop symptoms of depressive illness than other people. So we have these people that are genetically predisposed to depressive disease, and then we also see probably 40 or 50 percent of people that get depressed and have serious depressive illnesses that doesn't seem to run in their family, so there doesn't seem to be a genetic component to this for everybody, so it's kind of a mix of people that have a genetic vulnerability and people that don't. So depression may be inherited. And I think uh, the second bullet points out that depression can be as a result of stressful life events. And I think, you know, where we see this, and it's e most easy to understand, is if you have a major loss in your family, if you lose one of your children, if you lose your wife, then you will develop all of the symptoms of depression over the next few months. And looking at our diagnostic manual, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to separate the symptoms from serious grief and depressive illness. But yet you can see, of course, that the person who's grieving doesn't have an illness. It's a normal physiological, psychological response to, to trauma or to a big loss. And, Differentiating those things uh, sometimes is pretty difficult, but it's important to understand that people can develop all the signs and symptoms of a depressive disease as a result of bad stuff happening in their life. And other people, with, usually with chronic, recurring, inherited depressive illness, get depressed perhaps over and over many times in their life, and they have no idea why. So it just comes and is purely biological, genetic, and inherited versus those people where they come in and they know why. And the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is in a lot of the illnesses that we see around the hospital, to a different, different degrees, depression can be a symptom of various illnesses. So, so some of you would probably know that with a very underactive thyroid, depression is a pretty common symptom. So it's a recognized symptom in the medical textbooks of, of, th of an underactive thyroid. It's also pretty common pancreatic disease, with, you know, really all chronic disease, whether you're talking about the flu that goes on for a long period of time or cancer, and all of those things, you'd expect it to be fairly common to see, to see a depressed patient. So, you know, just to try and give you a quick and easy overview of the, the neurobiology of depression, you know, it's, these days we look at depressive illness, and this is kind of a new and evolving concept also. We, I'm going to show you a picture in a minute that kind of highlights a little area in people's brains where most of the biological problems seem to occur in depressed individuals. But really we know that depression involves circuitry in people's brains. So in your brain, there are parts of your brain that regulate your appetite, parts that regulate your emotions, parts that regulate your sleep. And they're widely separated in your brain. But in depressive illness, there are circuits that connect all these things. And we've sort of moved away from thinking depression is a problem in just one little part of your brain, because it's not. It was a good explanation that allowed us to help people understand what was going on, because we, we don't really understand this whole business. We come up with these notions to help people understand. Now we're starting to look at brain Brain illness with respect to depression is involving circuits and involving lots of different areas in people's brains. And we used to talk about, and most of you will know this, that when you talk about biochemistry or neurobiology and depression, people think about serotonin and serotonin. And a lot of that is marketing stuff. We've had a lot of drugs that work specifically on serotonin that are you know, reasonably effective antidepressants. And we get into this notion of thinking that if your serotonin is imbalanced, you'll get depressed. If you're depressed, you have a serotonin problem. And people forget or perhaps don't know that the reality is that when you have depression, you usually have alterations in your serotonin levels, your noradrenaline levels, your acetylcholine levels, your histamine levels, and your dopamine levels, and probably other less significant things. So there are a lot of chemical chemicals that are getting out of whack in the head of a depressed individual, and there are circuits 
of complex areas of your brain that are interconnected, that, uh, that are all affected, and a depressive illness is not a little piece in your brain. So, <clears throat> so hopefully we'll all recognize that this is somebody's brain. And this, uh, this, sort of sh this is an old slide. So we used to put this up and say, look at this right here. When you get depressed, this is where the problem is. The problem in depression comes from various parts of your brain, as I said. So perhaps some area that's responsible for appetite, some area for concentration, some area for mood. They all can be affected by depression, but the, the circuitry runs and they links and they seem to all funnel in through these main areas of your brain, which are nuclei in the mid, mid center of your brain. And if we were to do a fancy neuroimaging technique, like a PET scan or a SPECT scan, um, and look at what part of somebody's brain is not functioning in the seriously depressed patient, it would be these, these parts, because this is where all of the poorly functioning nervous cells sort of funnel in together, and this is, the, this is the most concentrated area of dysfunctional nervous system in a depressive individual. So, and partly I wanted to show you that also, because I think it's interesting for people to know that there are things like SPECT scans and positron emission scans, that if you put a depressed patient into a scan like that, it will take a picture and the radiologist will be able to say, well, she's depressed or she has fibromyalgia. So people often think that we don't have the ability to have tests for these things. We have tests that will show these things, not with 100% accuracy, but they show them pretty well. And, but they cost thousands and thousands of dollars and the system isn't prepared to fund them. If you go to places like the Mayo Clinic, you can get these things done if you're willing to pay for yourself. To go to the States and have them done, you can get them done. And I guess the other important aspect is that the people who make these funding decisions would argue that a good clinician can make the diagnosis with pretty much as much accuracy as a positron emission scan. So they're not about to pay a whole bunch of money for something they don't have to. But it's good to know, I think, and helps in our understanding to realize that we have the ability to diagnose these sorts of illnesses often with imaging techniques. So at a smaller scale, <clears throat> this slide is again an old slide that we used to show people to show them what goes on with serotonin in your brain. So you probably remember some of the stuff from high school biology where they talk about the nervous system and they have, you know, when you have a nerve in your brain and you decide that you want your big toe to move, then that's a, your brain sends a signal from your brain all the way down to your big toe, and you can be sure that isn't one five-foot or six-foot nerve. These nerves are shorter and they have gaps, and so when you're sending an electrical message around in your brain, there has to be a mechanism for the electrical message to get transmitted from the, from the nerve cell before the gap to the nerve cell afterwards, and typically we think of the electrical transmission being transmitted across the gap by little packages of chemicals, and we traditionally talked about these being little packages con containing serotonin. So when you look at all the different antidepressants that we use these days, and most of the antidepressants that are gonna show up in the next five years, most of them act in a, in a variety of different ways to increase the concentration of these little important chemicals in the gap. And the, the best known means by, with is, by which this is done is through blocking the reuptake of serotonin. So what that really means, in the nervous cell, the serotonin is manufactured in this presynaptic, presynaptic nerve. Somehow it gets the little package of chemical goes scooting across the cleft and then starts up an electrical transmission on the other side. And then when it's done its job, it, gets, it goes back into here and is destroyed and then rebuilt. And so the circuit goes around and around and around. And if we block the ability of this chemical to be taken back up into this cell where it's destroyed, then ultimately what you end up with is more of the chemical in this gap, which is the kind of the, the fundamental original thought as to the way antidepressants work. And it's still true. This is how serotonin, to a huge extent, improves depression by this blockade of reuptake into the presynaptic neuron. But I think it's, it's going to become really important for people to understand there's half a dozen different ways that the serotonin in this gap can be increased. It can be increased by not only stopping it by being taken up, it can be increased by manufacturing more of it, it can be increased by chemically breaking down less of it, it can be increased or functionally can be increased by finding different means of stimulating this neuron, 
without using serotonin. So there's lots of different ways that this simplistic sounding process can take place, because so, it isn't simple. But it's nice for us to try and make it sound understandable, I think. But I don't want you to mislead you into thinking that these systems are simple, because they're not. And I really don't want you to think that depression is all about serotonin, because it's not. And that's something that, you know, we've said that for a long time. Part of that sort of dovetailed with marketing strategies to push serotonin acting medications. But now the, the neuroscience is showing us that there's a lot of other chemicals involved in depression and we're coming up with new drugs that will work on those chemicals. So the thinking about serotonin is going to change a bit. So I've said that we have a book called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Disease and only in the last little while we've come out with the fifth edition. So it's important to know that the most important reason we have this book is so when I have a patient who has a major depressive episode, I can phone somebody in Chicago and say, I have a girl with major depressive episode, and he knows what I'm talking about, because we all use the same diagnostic criteria. So it's really a communication tool. So don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that this is guaranteed to be a 100% accurate definition of a disease that happens in people's brains. It's our best effort to explain symptoms that commonly occur in depressing people, in depressed people, but there's some variation around that. So it's not, again, it's not quite as simple as it sounds, but it's a wonderful communication tool. You have to have some form around which you can dis discuss diagnosis. So these are the symptoms that people have to have according to our latest edition of our statistical manual, which is really used around the world. There's another book published in Europe called the ICD, which is the International Classification of Disease. And in Europe, they use it to diagnose all medical diseases, including psychiatric diseases. But in the last decade, probably, in Europe, they're using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual published by the American Psychiatric Association, even in Europe. So really now, when you're talking to psychiatrists in Europe, they still are familiar with this DSM. So it's used around the world. So these are the symptoms. So in order for people to get a diagnosis of depression, you have to have symptoms for at least two weeks, and you have to have at least five of these symptoms. And out of these five that you must have from this group of nine, you must have either the first one or the second one. So you must be depressed most of the time, most days. You must have lost the ability to enjoy yourself. And you have to have a mix of these adding up to five. So you might sleep too much. You might sleep too little. You might eat too much. You might eat not enough. You might feel slowed down and tired and anergic. You might be restless and agitated. You might not have any energy. You might feel worthless, feel very guilty about things that you shouldn't logically feel guilty about. Or you might have a lot of trouble concentrating or be indecisive and you have, may have ongoing thoughts of increasing concern around death and suicide. So as I hinted in the beginning, this is a common illness. 17% of people at some time in their life will suffer this illness. It's a lot of people. That's the one in six number that you see people talking about. It's a ton of, it's just a lot of people. Also, so you have 17% approximately of people at some time in their life will have an illness, and a third of those people will have an illness that goes on for two years. So this is not a small illness. And as I said in my opening remarks, it's the illness that causes the greatest disability in North America compared to any other medical illness. So this is a serious illness. It has a high mortality rate, is very common, and causes lots of disease burden. So lots of people have lengthy episodes. People get frustrated sometimes that this doesn't get better quickly. And part of it is because our treatment is not perfect by any means. And part of it is it's the nature of the disease that often it goes on for lengthy periods of time. It's also very important to know that 50% of the people in the world that ever get depressed will get depressed once, and they'll never get depressed again. And that's the end of it. The other 50% will have more. So if you have, if you've had one episode, you have kind of a 50, 60 percent chance of getting depressed again. If you have two, it goes up to 60 or 90 percent. Once you've had two or three or four of these things, you're pretty close to a 100 percent chance of having another depression, which has implications in terms of how are we going to prevent you from getting sick again. If you've had three depressions and you're 35 years old and you come and ask me, how long should I take this antidepressant that isn't causing me any side effects and works for me? I would probably say you should really seriously think about taking it forever. Because this illness is a lot like a bladder infection or a pneumonia. If you, you know, the more often you have it, the more likely it'll come back. So we energetically try to treat people aggressively. 
to prevent people from getting sick again because it's a nasty illness and we want to do our best in a longitudinal sense of keeping people well for a long period of time. 15% of people that have ever been hospitalized with depression successfully kill themselves. That's a pretty high mortality rate. It's always been under-recognized, under-diagnosed, and under-treated. And I've said this about three times. It has a huge burden of disability in developing countries. So we often think, I think it's convenient and helpful to think about the symptoms of depression as if we lump them into emotional symptoms, physical symptoms, and cognitive or thinking symptoms. And I think, you know, we, looking back how we've looked at depression over the years, 15 years ago we gave people an antidepressant <clears throat> and we wanted them to be happier and we focused on their, emotional, on their emotional symptoms, we worried about their mood. And then 10 years ago or a bit less, people came out with drugs and with an understanding that two things happened. People, the, uh, people realized that many people with depression had unexplained physical aches and pains. So we began to see physical aches and pains as being a possible or probable symptom or closely related to depressive illness because the number percentage of people who are seriously depressed with some sort of unexplained pain is probably in excess of 30 or 40 percent. Then we came out with some medications and our efforts to try and treat chronic pain better and discover that some of the antidepressants are among the most effective medications we have for chronic pain. So kind of knowing that our antidepressants work for chronic pain and a lot of pain, a lot of patients with depression have pain, we began to focus and talk a lot more about the physical symptoms of pain. So we did that for a long time. First we talked about all the mood symptoms, we got drugs to help us with that. Then we began talking about the physical symptoms. And the thing that's kind of left, we haven't done a whole lot yet, in talk, talking about the, the cognitive symptoms. I can see I'm skipping ahead of, of my slides here. So uh, what I just finished saying will make a little more sense in a, mil in a minute. So this depression is, is broken down then into emotional symptoms, physical symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. So here they are, and we'll talk about them a little more. Um, so generally with the emotional symptoms of depression, the depressed mood is the most common and is usually the biggest symptom. I mean, more often than not, depressed people come to my office and say, I'm depressed. It's the most common thing that I see. 99% of people have depression as one of their symptoms. But there are a group of people that are mostly older fellows and younger <coughs> males that may present with irritability or often anger, like frank, serious anger in men, or inability to enjoy themselves. And in a small percentage of people, I don't know, 20% of people, particularly in those populations, anger or inability to enjoy yourself can be more common. So it, it sort of throws you off a bit sometimes when somebody comes to your office and you're, you know, you're, somebody sent you to this person to see them and they're having trouble making the diagnosis and it turns out they're depressed. Retrospectively, if you look back, sometimes you're seeing people and you ask them, are you sad? And they say no, and are you sad? And they say no, and people forget that some depressed people are not sad. And I think where I see it mostly is men my age or teenage boys, and they aren't sad, but they're very angry and they're very ir irritable and they often don't sleep, lost gain, lost weight, gained weight, can't concentrate, can't function at school or whatever, but sadness isn't predominant. So, you know, in teaching clinicians to look for depression, we have to remind them that there are people out there who won't be sad. So you have to ask about that. <clears throat> so this other symptom, which was the second criteria from our manual, anhedonia, is a fancy word that means this. It's a lack of interest in things that are normally pleasurable. So these are the major emotional symptoms of depression. Sexual loss of sexual interest is one, of the, one example of anhedonia. So let me just run through in a little more detail what some of these symptoms are. So these are some of the physical symptoms. Appetite change can go up or down, weight up or down, sleep more or less, energy more or less. So then, so we've talked about the emotional symptoms, the physical symptoms, and then these are the cognitive symptoms. So now these days we're kind of moving into realizing that we haven't done a very good job in helping people with cognitive symptoms. We've it's not, I have a lady in hospital now who somebody treated with an antidepressant a year or two ago. She came in feeling very sad, very depressed, was debating ending her life. Somebody put her on a medication and then in three months she went back to her doctor and said, yeah, I think my mood is okay, I'm not so sad anymore. 
and I think I'm okay. So she left, and then a year later she came back and said, well, my mood is okay, but I can't seem to manage my job, and I'm not doing very well at my job, and I do accounting, and I do mathematics, and I can't do it, and I don't seem to be doing very well in my social life, so I don't know what's wrong with me, but I think I'm, my depression is okay because I'm not sad anymore, but she still had cognitive symptoms. So when you, this lady is in the hospital now, when I talk to her, she feels emotionally very numb. She isn't able to laugh and giggle. She isn't really able to cry. But for a long time, she just thought that was better than feeling like killing herself. So she thought it was moving in the right direction. She didn't tell her doctor that she felt numb, and her doctor didn't ask her about that, because it's a pretty common occurrence in depression. So the, the cognitive symptoms are a big deal. I mean, when you think about why does this illness cause enormous amounts of disability? Why do people not do well in school when they're depressed? Why do they have trouble going back to work? And to a smaller degree, why are they why are their brains not working normally in a social environment? It's cognition. And we're, so we're not doing a very good job with the cognition. We're sort of realizing that. And our push these days is to try and get medications that will help people do better cognitively. Because we've done pretty well getting people's moods better. But if you're not so depressed and you're sort of happy, but you can't go and function at work, we haven't been very successful. And people are just starting to pay more and more attention to that now. So I think you'll see that as being a big trend in the treatment of depression. So this mostly relates to inability to concentrate, which in turn is linked to memory being a problem. And it's this stuff that makes people have trouble working. I have patients that go back to work and they cry all over their computer, but they can work. And the bosses will phone me and say, I don't know if she should be here. She's crying all the time. And I say, is she doing a good job? And, oh, great job. So you know, it's not the sadness that stops people from working. It's the ability to focus, concentrate, and remember, and do other cognitive things with your brain. So when you think about workplace disability, it's cognition. There are other things that are cognitive, all sort of self-explanatory, anxiety, guilt, self-esteem, hopelessness, and suicidal ideation are all cognitive thinking functions. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're discovering fairly recently, and people are talking about more and more and more, is this. Um, the attention is the problem, memory is a problem, and executive functioning, executive function refers to higher order cognitive functioning. So when you're talking about executive functioning, you're talking about planning or making decisions where you have to bring a lot of intellectual or a lot of information into your brain and do something complicated with it. It's sort of a more sophisticated thinking, not just you look good, I'm happy, it's more how am I going to plan my week next, next week considering all these factors, it's complex. And when you have cognitive problems, not surprisingly, some of the more complex functions of our brain get into trouble. People become indecisive. It's pretty consistent. When people are depressed, they usually show up with cognitive problems. And we're seeing now that often their moods get better, their physical symptoms may get better. But this stuff doesn't seem to get better for some people. Most people, you, you bring them in, you give them an antidepressant, they go home. And in two months, they're back at work. They're all happy. Everything's gone. All of their symptoms are better. But there's a group of people that don't do very well with treatment. And if you look at those people that have long-standing treatment, long-standing illness, and they're treatment resistant, and people are trying all sorts of medications, if you look and see what are the main symptoms with these people, it's usually the cognition that has not been very well treated. You know? And of course, they're still sad because their brain isn't working, I think. But you know, they aren't thinking of suicide, and it's more cognitive impairment. Um, and it can be a huge thing. So we see this pattern in our treatment. A lot of the patients that I see in my office, I don't get to see the ones very often who come into your office, you write them a prescription for one antidepressant, and one month they're all better, and six weeks they're back at work, and it's all done, and they never get sick again. I don't see that. All the family doctors that I work with see that, but I don't get to see that. I see the people that have been on three or four or five antidepressants and have been struggling for two years or six years or 15 years with depression. Those are the people that I see. And those are the people that there's a huge cognitive impairment burden on top of their emotional problems. And it's you know, one of the major roadblocks and has a major contributor to this disability in the workplace. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the types of depression. So I think I'll just do that first by going through a few slides that have some descriptions of various types of depression that are not out of our diagnostic manual. These are things that people 
parlay around and that people have probably heard about. So these are not things that are from a new diagnostic manual. They're just common used expressions that I thought I'd explain. So let me start with the second one. Most people know that there's this thing out there called bipolar illness. It used to be called manic depressive illness. And it means that you have times in your life when you're very, very depressed and you have times in your life when you're the opposite. So you have alternating periods of being very depressed with periods of being euphoric or ecstatic or extremely happy. So you kind of have these two poles of moods and they call it bipolar because there's two poles. You have a, sad, a sadness and then the euphoria. So taking that a step backwards, and they used to talk about unipolar depression. When I came out of school and for the first decade that I worked, what we call major depressive illness now, we used to call unipolar depression, just meaning that there wasn't a second pole. It was just a cycle of series of depressions or an illness called depression without the euphoria and the mania. So we had these two categories that were pretty useful. They were pretty easy to understand. Still, uh, we have psychotic depression is still included in the textbooks. It's sort of coded or referred to slightly differently, but psychotic depression is a very serious illness that occurs in about 5% of seriously depressed people. These people are psychotic, and that means that they have delusions or hallucinations. So they believe things that aren't true, or they hear things that nobody else hears, perhaps. And, you know, I guess a couple of common examples of that are often... Uh, I remember I had a lady that I looked after a few years back who had a horrible psychotic depression and she believed that her heart had stopped and all the blood in her veins had turned to cement or sludge or something. And they couldn't convince her that this wasn't true. So she had this delusion that was bodily that was in keeping with the fact that she thought she was going to die and she sure was sure she wasn't going to be around tomorrow. So yeah, she had this, all these delusional somatic thoughts. A fellow I knew fairly recently became very rapidly, horribly depressed, and he became convinced that in his setting of being depressed that he'd made huge mistakes in his life. He thought he'd done all sorts of evil things. He believed that he was evil. He believed that the entire industry in which he worked knew he was evil. He thought they were monitoring him. They th he thought there were cameras all over the place. I was with him at a ski village in October, and there was no people there, and he was 100% convinced there was a stage that people had put him and I into the ski village and they were monitoring what he was doing up there to prove that he was evil before they killed him. So this was depression with a psychotic component and he was horribly sick and he's better. So, But it's a very scary illness. It's a medical emergency. These people need to be put in the hospital and they do pretty well. They do well, but you need to get a hold of them before things get really, really, really bad. So fortunately it's not too common. It's interesting. The treatment is pretty successful usually. So we have this other idea about categorizing depression into reactive and endogenous depressions. And really that just refers to those people who come into you with a depression and say, I'm really depressed, doctor, and I can tell you why. They have an identifiable reason as to why they're depressed. We call that reactive because we think we can see what they're reacting to. And then we have another group of people who come in and they say, I'm very depressed. I have no idea why. And you ask them all these questions about what's been happening in your life and you can't figure out why either. So we refer to endogenous as being the mechanisms for this depression are coming from inside the person, has nothing to do with stressors in their life. So it has, it's a, it's a category, it's, it's, it's a way of categorizing depression that is relatively useless because regardless of whether you can identify why you got depressed or not, in the end you will have the same symptoms and in the end your treatment will be the same. So roughly speaking, if you come to see me and you tell me that you're depressed because your marriage fell apart and you lost your business and then you got depressed and you have all the same symptoms as the man who comes to see me the next day who has no idea why he got depressed. For both of those people, I would say to them, you need antidepressants and you need some psychotherapy and you can kind of pick and choose among those things because those are your options. So the treatment for the, both of these things is interestingly the same. But the, the one small difference would be that we if we're doing our job right, we should tell everybody that's depressed that psychotherapy is a really good option for you. If you look at the research, psychotherapy works very well. In certain studies, in some studies, in a lot of studies, it looks as effective as medication. I think what they tend to select out is the people that are mildly to moderately depressed, as you might expect, do pretty well with some counseling and different types of psychotherapy. The ones that are horribly well usually need some medication.
and I guess what I was going to say is if, if there's any difference in what you do for somebody who came in and said, I'm depressed because my husband used to beat me all the time, you would be able to focus the therapy that you're, that you're recommending them to. So you're going to recommend that they go see a therapist with a focus on helping them get out of it. Don't go back to that guy who's beating you all the time, right? So it helps narrow what you might offer the psychotherapy around, but it doesn't change the fact that for depressive illness, the evidence for response to medications is about as good as the evidence for response to psychotherapy. And having said that, remember that we're talking about the people who do well with counseling therapy tend to be the ones that aren't horribly sick, and the ones who really don't do well without medications tend to be the ones that are pretty sick. But they both work really well, and I, just, I find I have to say that over and over again because in my world of psychiatry, in my world of medicine, medication is the thing that sort of people look to me for most of the time. But it's not the right answer for everybody with depression. And it's certainly not the only answer. So an interesting type of depression that you may have heard about is seasonal affective disorder. It occurs in 2 to 3 to 4 percent of the population. The thing that distinguishes this illness is it always shows up at the same time of year and it always goes away at the same time of the year. So if you live in Alberta, Typically, what we tend to see is, and I have a number of patients who come, who I have a number of patients who kind of in October, early November begin to get depressed. And then I put them on antidepressants and then they get better. Or I send them to Costco where they buy a relatively inexpensive light box and then hopefully they get better. Or if they have enough money, they go to Hawaii or Phoenix with their wife and then they get better. The interesting people, I think, are the ones that. <laughs> They come to see me and they're depressed, and then I put them on medication, but then they phone me and say, I don't need my antidepressants anymore because I'm going to Phoenix. So they go to Phoenix and they stay well in all the sunlight, but then they come back for Christmas to be with their children and they get depressed again. And they go back on their antidepressants and then they go back to Phoenix for the rest of the year and don't take their antidepressants. So it's quite striking when you see it that clearly. And you don't really see it that clearly very often, but you see it and it's interesting. We don't really know why. We assume because of the response to light therapy that probably has a lot to do with re reduced daylight hours. There are some people who think it has due to changes in altered barometric pressure, precipitation, or temperatures. I think it's probably light. Um, so in the DSM-4, not in the DSM-5, we had this thing called major depression that we've been talking about tonight. The other, the other common very prevalent uh, mood disorder or depressive illness is something called minor depression or dysthymia. So in the DSM-4, that just simply meant that instead of having five out of nine symptoms from our diagnostic book, it needed to have three, and they had to last for a long time, perhaps a year. But so, and it was an interesting illness, I think, because often it got missed because people with dysthymia who perhaps are sad most of the time and have some trouble concentrating and some sleep disturbance, but don't have more more serious symptoms, often they function not too badly. And after a while, they just sort of think maybe everybody else is like this, and maybe this is just kind of normal. So you get a lot of people with a low-grade chronic depression who think, that's just the way I am, probably nothing I can do about it. Maybe I'm not so different from everybody else. And they're usually well enough that they can fake it. So they go on for a long time. And their response to treatment probably isn't as robust or not as, I guess it's not as impressive with antidepressants, but they do pretty well with treatment. Um, and then I guess one of the common things we see is somebody will, probably every third time I'm on call, I see somebody in the emergency who tells me, I'm horribly depressed, I've been horribly depressed for three months. And I say, okay, so three months ago, you were a happy guy and now you're depressed. Well, no, doctor, I've never really ever been depressed. So then they describe this lifelong history of low-grade depression that took some horrible turn to the worse, and they got very depressed for three months. So then they have a, then they really have a diagnosis of a long-standing mild mood disorder with a superimposed more serious mood disorder, and then we talk, call that double depression, where they have one superimposed upon the other. And I don't know. Yep. Okay. So there it is. So in DSM-5, they've changed it. So now they have a thing in DSM-5 that you don't have to, you won't hear much about this for a while. But in the DSM-5. They have major depressive episode, which is what we've been talking about all night, but they don't have dysthymia anymore. So they have something called persistent depressive disorder. So that's the new, new diagnos diagnosis for people that have long-standing depression, but it includes people with long-standing mild depression and long-standing serious depression. 
So we used to have a specifier for serious depression where we would say, this lady has major depressive episode, but if it had gone on for two years, we called it chronic or something. Now we just say that if you have a depressive illness, whether it's mild or severe, and it's gone on for a long time, that it's a persistent depressive disorder. So they've changed it. And you won't hear much about that. It won't be used much for a while. So we have this artificial notion in psychiatry when it comes to treatment that remission should be the goal of treatment. So that kind of means that you should get pretty darn well, but not perfect. So remission is a strange concept that was put out there by the pharmaceutical companies because they had to do something to measure how well their drugs worked. So they do things like take a rating scale like the Beck Depression rating scale, which you may have heard of, and say that you need to score when you're really depressed, you probably score 3 out of 10, but when you hit remission, you will be then 7 out of 10. So they use that 7 out of 10 to define remission by some drug companies and some studies. Then you get another drug company doing a different study, and they say, no, well, we're going to use the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, and we want you to be 24 out of 30. So it's kind of arbitrary. It's a weird... The idea is a good one that we want you to at least be mostly better to help ensure that you won't get sick again. <laughs> And also, we want you to be mostly better because, of course, you have a better likelihood of getting all better. You have a better likelihood of doing all these things in a more normal way. And you're not as likely to get sick again, which I think is the most important thing. You can't, and it's a hard thing, you know, when you, I think one of the hardest things I do is to see some 25-year-old girl who comes in with some horrible depressive illness, and then she's all better in six months, and she says to me, doctor, how long do I have to be on these medications for? And if that is her second or third illness, or under certain other circumstances, I'm saying to her, you know, you need to stay on them for a whole year. And then, you know, you might have to stay on them for longer. Young people don't want to hear that. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about multiple sclerosis or depression or schizophrenia. It's a really difficult thing to talk a young person into understanding that they have a chronic illness, that they have to wise up and be responsible and act like an adult. and. <laughs> quit doing a lot of things for a while. You have to lay off the parties, you have to do a whole bunch of stuff. And I think as a half-sensible psychiatrist, you have to realize that your 18-year-old depressed girl is not going to quit going to parties. She's not going to go to bed every night at 10 o'clock, and she is going to mix alcohol with your antidepressants. So you kind of have to think about that stuff, because you can't sort of say, well, if you don't do all this stuff right, I'm not going to see you anymore. So, I mean, you have to have some flexibility, but I seem to be digressing again. So, and so I'll tell you one more thing is um, over the last decade, we've sort of held remission as our goal. So we say, people say, what's the goal of treatment doctor? We say, we want you to get into remission. So we kind of want you to get mostly better depending on how we define it. Now we know that's not really good enough. We want you to be all better, of course. So, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about medical illness, neurological illness, or psychiatric illness. The, the goal is to restore function as much as is possible. So our goal is that your mood gets better, your ability to go to work gets better, your ability to be a good husband, blah, 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 all gets better. So we're looking at the optimal functioning across all areas is now our new goal in psychiatry, which is kind of not brand new, but you'll see that it's going to replace this concept of remission before too long, except with the drug companies will probably hang on to this because it's more measurable, I think. Um, so this, I think, is an interesting slide. <clears throat> it sort of gives, puts some numbers onto the idea that we do a pretty crappy job of treating depressive illness in terms of how often do we find depressed people and how often do we do a good job for them. So if you look at this, 40% of people that are seriously depressed only 40% ever go and ask anybody for help. Most of those people go to the family doctor, which is a very sensible thing to do. The main reason that they don't ask for help is about stigma, which is where we're all here today trying to eliminate some of that. So those that go to see, a, a, so 40% of people go see the family doctor, half of them come out of there with the right diagnosis, and out of that half, only about half of those get adequate care. So I think if you do the math on that, it comes out to less than 10%. I don't know if it's 4% or 7%, but it's not much. So 17% of the people in the world will have a serious depression at some time in their life. 10% of those people will be properly treated. That's pretty scary because, again, it's a serious illness with a high mortality rate. costs the country and families an enormous amount of money. It's a big deal. It's a terrible success rate for such a big deal. <clears throat> 
an interesting thing about antidepressants so far, if you line up all the antidepressants that we have, we probably have 25 of them. If you look at them, we have maybe 12 that are commonly used these days, but we have lots of antidepressants. None of them have a success rate that exceeds 65% or so. They're all about that. They're all about the same. There was a few that came out with 40% success rates, but they're gone now. So all of our antidepressants have a 65% chance of fixing. If you walk into a doctor's office and you're depressed and he has a bunch of samples on the desk, that's fine because it doesn't really make much difference which ones he picks statistically because they all have a 65% chance. So we need to get better at knowing which drug will work for which, pe which people. And in order to do that, we have to understand in more detail what chemistry is messed up in this depressed person's head and what chemistry, what chemicals will this drug fix, right? So then you can line up the biochemical disturbance in your patient's brain with the medication that you know will work on those particular chemicals. And we are, in fact, getting better at that. There's a world-renowned psychiatrist in Toronto, I think, who's coming out with a new scheme and a small little textbook telling doctors how to do that that I'm sure will not be deadly accurate, but they're moving in that direction, you know, and uh, so it's interesting. I think that they're coming up with these personalized treatment plans. So the suggestion is that we will figure out what chemicals are messed up in your head and we will give you a drug that will fix that particular problem and then everything will be much better. And I hopefully we'll get there someday. The all antidepressants take a while to work. We usually say three to four weeks, two to four weeks in the treatment resistant patient or somebody who's had three or four trials of antidepressants, you better triple that. Because I think when you see somebody who's been depressed for five years or has had four trials of antidepressants, the next time you try them on an antidepressant, you better wait three months. Because there's a lot of people that don't get better in six weeks. And it's a big mistake that a lot of doctors make. You need to be prepared to be very patient and, and really go slowly with people that are having trouble getting better. And all of these things have side effects. It doesn't mean everybody gets them, but they all have potential side effects. These are the serotonin drugs that we have. This stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake in in Inhibitors. These are the ones that are currently on the market. This is the newest one. It's been around for six or seven years. It's the most popular drug in Canada right now in terms of antidepressants. The rest of them are pretty good. I mean, they're all good. Some of them, uh, they're all, but they're all different, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. So these drugs that I just showed you, the SSRIs, they work by increasing the serotonin in that little gap in, in your nervous system. So they increase the serotonin, and they also have some action on noradrenaline and, and dopamine, and also on a few other neurotransmitters. They're pretty safe in overdose. People don't die from taking 300 Prozac. If you mix it with booze or mix it with something else, you might. But these are fairly safe drugs. They're pretty safe in pregnancy. There's a couple of exceptions to that. Interestingly, these days, if you talk to people that are experts in pregnancy and depression and say, I'm a very depressed woman, I'm three months pregnant, I really don't want to take antidepressants, and you ask the experts, they will tell you these days, universally, that your depression will cause more risk to your child than the antidepressant, which has been a pretty powerful statement to be able to give to young women because they get that. Because the, the fundamental reason, of course, that they're not, not wanting to take pills of any sort is they want to do that wonderful thing of being a great mother and doing nothing to harm their child. And people don't realize that being horribly depressed throughout pregnancy causes problems for babies, measurable problems. And this is not a, it's the only kind of information that's getting out there, but people have been studying that for quite a while. So what else can I tell you? It's also pretty safe in breastfeeding because a very small percentage of what floats around in the mother's bread, blood gets transmitted into the breast milk. So, you know, when it comes to breastfeeding, when it comes to all of these things, I mean, you can stand up with a group of young women who are pregnant and say, you know, this drug is safe in pregnancy, this drug is safe in breastfeeding. A lot of them are going to say, no thanks, because they have this notion that the world imparts upon them of how they want to be a pregnant mother, and it's hard to dissuade young girls about that. But I think there are more resources, there's more good organizations that pass out information about that. There are more, more people that are specialized in those areas. There's more textbooks out there. So we're doing better. One of the things that in women, it's a whole different talk, but in women there are periods of hormonal vul vulnerability where people have serious mood problems. So you wouldn't be surprised to hear that when your hormones are out of whack, when you're menopausal, when you're premenstrual, and when you're postpartum, you're at much greater risk for having
depression. But you know when else your hormones are out of whack is when you're depressed. So it just kind of makes sense, right? That depression is a vulnerable time. <laughs> depression is more common in pregnancy than in people who are not pregnant. And people have had this notion for a long time that is wrong, that protect, depression protects against pregnancy. It doesn't. You're at greater risk when you're depressed. So the side effects that are, as I said, a lot of people don't get side effects. But if you're going to, there's a 5 to 10% chance that you might get a bit nause nauseous for a few days. I, you know, I don't know, one in every two or 300 people that try these drugs have so much difficulty with how it upsets their stomach that they just can't take them. So it happens, but it's not common. Headache sometimes comes for a few days, 5 to 10% of people. Agitation, I don't know, probably 10 or 15% of people get more anxious moving along the spectrum towards agitation. Some people, if they're more anxious or agitated, have trouble sleeping or they might be a bit tired. These are all 5 to 10% things, right? So there, most people don't stop these drugs because of side effects. But again, I get to see the people that do because then the family doctors are saying, well, I've tried these three, and they all had overwhelming side effects. So what are you going to do next? But really, most people tolerate them pretty well. Sexual side effects are really common. So we try to tell family doctors these days that when you're Ladies are depressed. They're not going to have any sexual enthusiasm because that's a symptom of their depression. When you give them antidepressants, they're not going to have any sexual, they're going to have trouble with their sexual interest and performance because the antidepressants get in the way. So you need to ask them before you put them on antidepressants, how are you functioning sexually so that you can figure out when they've been on them for three months and they're still depressed, is the problem, is the sexual problem a medication thing? or a depression thing, because it could be either. So the only way you can make sense out of that is to know where it came from by asking the questions. And I think people are getting a little braver about asking men and women about sexual problems, because more than 50% of people will have a sexual issue of some sort on these drugs. So we keep telling people, ask the questions, ask the questions, and people are getting better. <clears throat> and I think then on the flip side of the coin, probably half of the 15-year-old girls that wander into my office, the third thing they tell me is about their sex life. So it's kind of used to be that I couldn't get a young girl to come to my office unless her mother dragged her there. And now when they come and they tell me all the stuff that I don't want to know, right? But, but I'm glad that they're there talking about their depression and the other stuff I can survive, I guess. So apart from the SSRIs, we have others. So we have drugs that work on norepinephrine and dopamine and don't work on serotonin at all. This is Wellbutrin in the United States. It's the most commonly prescribed antidepressant in Canada. It's number six, number seven, number eight, something like that because of marketing. It's a good drug. Doesn't work for everybody, none of them work for anybody, everybody. This is another, this is this kind of the second most common class of antidepressants in North America. It works on serotonin and norepinephrine. It's Effexor, Cymbalta, and Pristique are the ones that we have available in Canada. This drug is a good drug. It works on serotonin, and it works on serotonin through a slightly different mechanism, and it works on noradrenaline, it's called Remeron. It's a very effective drug. It has terrible side effects for most people. Almost invariably causes quite significant weight gain and almost invariably causes a lot of sedation. But it's a good drug, but not many people, you know, I don't, I don't give this drug to young women. How many young women are going to be happy when they come back and say, well, I'm happier these days, but I put on 40 pounds in the last year. They're not going to take it, right? So it's nice that it works, but people don't take it. But there are places where you have to use it, and it is a very effective drug. It just has unfortunate side effects. <clears throat> Manorix is available. It's a good drug. It's not commonly used in Canada. These are old drugs, rarely used anymore. These drugs are what they call, they're sort of referred to as messy drugs because they work on every neurotransmitter in your brain. They work on all those things I talked about before. They work on dopamine, acetylcholine, histamine, serotonin, noradrenaline. So they had a huge success rate. They were very powerful drugs that came loaded with all sorts of side effects. And nobody uses them anymore because they've all gone generic. They're complicated drugs to use, but they're, you know, if you go to a clinic that specializes in treating difficult to treat people, you'll see this stuff being used a lot because they're very powerful. But they come with a lot of side effects for a lot of people. The other thing that's been a big change is, as I said before, these drugs that are commonly used are not, not dangerous in overdose for the most part. Some of these old drugs are quite dangerous in overdose. So they all have side effects. If we understand how they work, if you know that this drug works on acetylcholine, you'll know that it will cause you sexual problems and it will dry out your mouth and give you bladder problems, maybe. 
if you know that it works on histamine, it'll help you sleep at night, it'll crank up your appetite. If you know it works on serotonin, it will make your mood better. If it works on norepinephrine, it will kind of light up your life and you see those nice pictures on TV saying, put the color back in my life. And that's, that's the noradrenaline stuff working. And if you have one that works on dopamine, it just sort of puts the spotlight on things. So those, that's kind of the stimulant thing that the, the dopamine is what you get when you're using Wellbutrin or when you're using Dexedrine or Ritalin. They're stimulants. And you know they're useful in some source of depression. And Wellbutrin is a good antidepressant that works through a different mechanism than the stimulants. So just really quickly, we talk about the selective serotonin reuptake uptake inhibitors that we have, and people sometimes will say to me, well, what, aren't they all the same? Don't they all work on depression? Why do you, if one doesn't work, why do you use another one? Because they're the same, right? But they're not the same. So we think it would sound like these drugs work by, re, by inhibiting serotonin reuptake. They work in many different ways. So this is kind of a put together whatever composite slide. Some of them, some of them like Paxil, for example, or Paroxidine, has a lot of effect on liver enzymes. So it's a, it's a complicated drug to use in a medical patient that's on a number of other drugs that can affect the concentration of carbamazepine, anticonvulsants, and other important medical drugs that people use. Um, Paxil also is kind of interesting. It's through its effect on the liver. If you drink a lot of grapefruit juice, the grapefruit juice binds to the same liver enzyme, and if you're on Paxil, you'll get sick because your concentration of Paxil in your blood will go up up to 10 times greater. So there's a lot of curious phenomenon going on out there. If you, Some of the drugs will work on acetylcholine. A lot of them work on dopamine. Some work on nor, noradrenaline, some are serotonin. So the idea is just to show you that to different degrees, these six different drugs work in different ways based on this composite picture. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. They're all, <clears throat> they are, are all different and it's quite reasonable. If you look at the guidelines around the world for, if you put somebody in Prozac and they don't get better, what do you do next? You know, it's a, the recommendations are either give them another drug like Zoloft, which is another SSRI, or go to something different. So it's, you know, they would recommend one as much as the other. So the idea of trying a bunch of these different SSRIs is a good idea because of this. So they're not completely selective. They do more than just work on serotonin. My secretary made a mistake here, I guess. So these are six drugs. These are six drugs in the same class, and they are fairly unique, and they are not all created equal. So when it comes to the differences, so you know, if you know that these drugs work on, as I said, histamine, they will make you tired and gain weight. If you know that they work on dopamine, they might keep you awake at night and give you uh, activation. You can, some of them uh, are more likely to give you sexual side effects, and you should be able to predict that if you know how the drugs work. So that's the, kind of the value of understanding how they work. Some of them uh, are more likely to cause a discontinuation syndrome. So some of, them, some of you may know that if you, for some people, if you stop an antidepressant abruptly, you'll get quite sick. You'll feel like you have a horrible flu, you'll be hot and sweaty, and you can't sleep, and you're more anxious. And some people have that kind of withdrawal thing that can go on for up to six months. Some people have it for one day and it's very mild and that's the end of it. So it's extremely variable. But some of these drugs are much more likely to cause it to others. So the reason that the, uh, the difference is, again, because of this slide. So in the future, what they're telling us is that rather than making antidepressants that work only on serotonin, and work only on a certain little area of your brain. We're going to be looking at drugs, ideally, that have less side effects and are going to use multiple systems and work using different mechanisms of action. So we're kind of moving away, as I said in the beginning, from thinking that if we crank up your serotonin, you'll be all better. If we fix your serotonin, that one little purple area in the middle of your brain, you'll be all better. And we're realizing now there's huge interlocking circuits within your brain that we have to work on and we have to hammer away at them with drugs that will work in different ways on different neurochemicals in your brain. So it's getting more complicated. I think uh, next year there'll be a drug out called vortioxetine that does, it, do, does this that most people think probably holds a fair bit of promise, but although it'll be available in a year, you probably won't see it being prescribed in Canada for a couple of years. And there's a few others, so there's always drugs coming along, I think, but these ones that seem to be kind of using this multimodal
means of working through different circuits in your brain through different mechanisms are the ones that seem to hold most promise according to the experts. So these are them again, multimodal agents, different modes of action. <clears throat> and they seem to have quite a bit of promise. Um, and they're particularly effective at getting rid of the cognitive symptoms. So as I've said before, people who work in this field are noticing that a lot of our patients are struggling with cognitive symptoms even after they seem to be much improved on their depression. <laughs> so I think the pharmaceutical indus industries are responding by trying to find drugs that will target cognitive symptoms. So we need to improve cognitive function. So I'm getting towards the end of all this. So other treatments that some of you may have heard of. So we talked about psychotherapy a little bit, or I mentioned it in passing. We have ECT uh, that people use across the world these days still. That's probably the oldest treatment we have. It's called shock therapy. It's, you know, it's interesting that people think this is a creepy, old, scary thing, and the people that it's recommended for most is people that are elderly and on 12 different drugs. So we might give ECT to a 90-year-old who's on 12 different drugs because we don't want to give them more drugs. It's recommended for pregnant women, and it's recommended for frail people that have complex medical problems. So uh, as I said before, most of the antidepressants have about a 65% chance of working. ECT, if your diagnosis is right, has an, a greater than 70% chance of working. So they did an interesting study, a little study in the States 10 years ago, and asked a couple hundred psychiatrists, if you only had one shot at getting better from your depression, what would you pick? They picked ECT. So I think it sort of tells you that the people, hopefully you know a lot about it, would pick it because they know a lot about it and aren't caught up in the stuff most of us think about it from watching TV. There's a fairly new thing out that's been available in some parts of Canada for two or three years called transcranial magnetic stimulation in Alberta. It's actually been available in Ontario for a decade. In Alberta, we've had uh, the ability to do this in Pinoca on a research basis for, I think, maybe five years. It's different than ECT. They apply a mild ma magnetic current to the part of your head. You go there every day for half an hour for 20 sessions. And this, we don't know what the success rate is. I've seen a few really, really wonderful successes with this treatment and, and seen lots of people that didn't do well with this treatment. There's another one out that's fairly new in the last few years, deep brain stimulation. They implant a stimulator, put it on your vagus nerve in your neck. It's sort of stimulating your brain to create more, create more neurochemicals like the antidepressants do. We have a variety of drugs that we would add to antidepressants if your antidepressant isn't working as well as we would like. If you're depressed and you're anxious, we might give you something for your anxiety. If you're a psychotic, we might give you something for your psychosis. If you need something... These days, because our drugs and many people don't work perfectly, we're often looking at people coming in saying, I'm pretty good, but I'm not great. And then if you're pretty good, you know, we're reluctant to take you off this drug that made you pretty good. We're more likely to try and make it work better, which might mean a bigger dose. It might very well mean a lower dose, or it might mean adding something to it to make it work better. So the most commonly recommended things are adding a small dose of lithium to your antidepressant. If that doesn't work, you could add a bigger dose of lithium. There's a drug you all see on TV called aripiprazole or Abilify that is working really well as an add-on agent to make these things work better. There's three or four antipsychotics that if you add them to an antidepressant, they do a good job of making the antidepressant work better often. So lots of things that we can do. We mentioned light therapy before. There's always things out there that people are experimenting with. And lots of holistic medicinal alternative preparations that are recommended by the people that sell those things. Psychotherapy, as I said, everybody should be told that psychotherapy is a very effective tool for depression. It works as well as medication on average. Um, not too surprising, it has less side effects um, and it does all these nice things for you. One of the problems with when you really look at the practical aspects of all that, if you're in Toronto and you go to your doctor and say, I'm depressed, he will think, well, maybe I'll give you Prozac and we can start that today, or maybe I'll give you CBT so you can go see somebody in nine months and it'll cost you 200 bucks an hour. Most people say, I'll take the Prozac, right? So in, Al in Red Deer, we're lucky. It's not so difficult to access therapy. Um, doesn't cost anything through the mental health services. So, but in many cities, it's very difficult and time consuming to find a good therapist. <clears throat> 
And I think something that we all have to always remember, if you don't have a home over your head, if you don't have any money, if you don't have your psychosocial needs met, you're not going to get better. So we have to take these homeless people and work on some of that stuff while we're working on the other aspects of their depression. Cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy are the ones that have respected scientific evidence. If you go to our clinic, you'll see people doing 10 different kinds of therapy. And so the cl clinicians know that a lot of these therapies work. Nobody has the money to put uh, some of these therapies to, through rigorous scientific testing. So the fact that they don't have evidence doesn't really mean that they don't work. It just means they don't have evidence. And we're in a world of medicine these days where we prescribe things that have evidence. As a, as a rule, they usually don't, but I don't know, I would think maybe in 25 or 30 percent of people, so quite commonly they do. So most commonly, if your antidepressant uh, starts to become less effective after a few months or after a couple of years, most commonly a little dose adjustment will take care of that, but sometimes not, at which point if it has worked pretty well or is still working somewhat, we'd usually get into adding something to get it working again. Or, you know, ultimately you can try something else. So it is a pretty common scenario, yeah. Usually not, but maybe in a third of people. The studies, you know, there are studies out there. I was at a, the Canadian Psychiatric Convention in Ottawa last week. So I talked to these guys who are addiction experts and they showed me some really nice studies of hundreds of people that are actively drinking, actively using, and they treated them with antidepressants and compared to them a group of people that weren't actively using anything, the results were the same. So that's very different than what we used to tell people. We used to tell people, and this guy said to me, he said the truth would be that if you have a teenage boy who's drinking his face off, you should tell, we used to tell him, if you don't quit drinking, you're not going to get better. He said to me, Norm, I still tell him that lie. You've got to quit drinking or you're not going to get better. But he says the research doesn't support that anymore. So now that we have more and more research, then the flip side of it is, you know, the success rate of treating people who truly have a depressive disease and they're drinking or using, the success rate is pretty good. So, you know, what have you got to lose? If somebody comes to your office and they're drinking half a case of beer a day and they're depressed and you're worried that if they mix Paxil with that, I don't know, that they might get more dry mouth or they might get more, they might get drunk more easily, but there's no serious concerns and the success rate is pretty good, you should probably treat them. It doesn't mean that if you fix their depression, they'll quit drinking, which is another, you know, it's something that we'd like to think before. If we just fix that underlying problem, all your substance abuse problems would disappear, but no. So you need to, you need to go after the drinking or the drug use and the depression at the same time. That's how we look at it today. You can use, we have drugs that aren't metabolized by the liver, so you can get around that in somebody with liver disease, somebody with hepatitis or serious liver disease, or just somebody who's worried about their liver, you can get around it, because we have drugs that are not metabolized by the liver. I think we all wonder about that. I, I'm not aware of any research or studies that would say, you know, you need to take them off for a while so the brain will come back to normal again. Like, I don't think that's supported by the research. But I think, what, you know, what I think, and maybe this isn't exactly what you're asking me, but if you put somebody on serotonin, on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and it cranks up your serotonin levels, coincidentally, in a complicated way, it will reduce your norepinephrine levels. So in some people, although you're getting happier because your serotonin is being cranked up, you're getting more depressed because your noradrenaline is being dropped. So you end up with this person who's kind of locked in and doesn't really have any moods and is still feeling crappy. <clears throat> and, you know, so some, sometimes your antidepressants can make your depression worse. So that's not quite what you asked me, but it's sort of an answer, right? The difference between bipolar type 1 and bipolar type 2, 
is that if you have bipolar type 1, when you're going through your manic or your high episodes, they must last for a minimum of seven days in bipolar 1, and you must either be psychotic or need to be hospitalized. So it's, it's a level of severity. So if you're bipolar 2, you'd have less sleep, you'd be sort of euphoric, you wouldn't be believing that you're going to turn into Gordon Lightfoot or Madonna, so you wouldn't be delusional, but you would still be ill, right? So it's, it's severity. So if you're sick enough to be that you have to be hospitalized to manage you, or if you're psychotic, then it's, it's automatically bipolar 1. So the difference is in the degree of severity of the up periods. For sure. I mean, you, again, you see exceptions to that little rule, but generally speaking, yes. From a medication perspective? Yes. Yeah, really you do. I mean, people have favorites, but, you know, the research and the evidence doesn't really support that. So, no, yeah, you treat them the same. It's a... Uh, it can be a tricky thing to treat. You know, we're doing a bipolar talk one of these nights. If you're around, you should come. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know. I think, uh, you know, I think if you knew that you were, if you, I mean, I guess a lot of people know that they're vulnerable to depression because of their experience of having been depressed a few times. So if for some reason you wanted to set out to live a life where you were less likely to get depressed, I think you would just do the common sense things. Like again, those are not things that I could say the research shows this and the research shows that, but I think you'd need to, you know, you need to sleep well and eat well and avoid stress and probably go live in Tahiti if you want to avoid stress, I guess. Get out of Alberta where everybody are workaholics and doing crazy things. I think it's very empowering just to feel that you're doing something even if there isn't any research to support it, right? So the mindfulness thing where you just sort of, you know, you probably know more about it than me, but basically people are becoming more and more aware on a moment-to-moment -moment basis of what's going on in their emotional state in the here and now, you know? So you're monitoring yourself more carefully, getting more tuned in with yourself. I think it's just a wonderful thing to enhance your life, whether you're trying to prevent depression or just be a happier person, you know? And it's, it's a good, it's just a nice thing to learn. It's not, it takes practice, but it's not that difficult. They're using it in all sorts of psychiatric things. There's lots of good research to show that it helps with some things. And, but I think he's right. Diet, sleep, rest, avoid stress, get out of Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the most obvious thing for me when I s spend my night, like last night, in the, on an average night in the emergency room, of the percentage of people with emotional psychiatric problems that I get to see, I think on average 30% of them have, are coming in and they're using it's drugs. Yeah. So that, to me, that's. I yeah. I walk around the ward in our hospital. We have 32 beds on the inpatient ward. I would bet you anything that at any given time, do you think in that 10, per 10 people, 10 or more people out of 30 beds have serious alcohol or drug problems, as well as some kind of psychiatric problem. I know, I, you know, in my free time I do a fair bit of traveling. I sail around these quiet little islands in the different parts of the world, and you meet these people that live on an island, and their goal in life every day is to be with their family. And they talk to me, and I think, oh, you'd probably like to come and see this half million dollar sailboat I rented. They couldn't care less. They want me to come and see their little house and maybe stay overnight for dinner. And they can't imagine for the life of them why I would come back and work in this country because I'm working myself to death. I'm going to have a heart attack. Who cares if I live in a mansion, right? And really, I think that I, the more I travel around and talk to these people, I think, what am I doing in this country? But I, I'm too old now. I couldn't function down there anymore. So. Yeah, I think most often what you see with that, unexplained physical symptoms more often come 
from anxiety, and anxiety is one of the very common symptoms of depression, right? So, you know, I think we see that kind of stuff mostly in severely anxious patients, but then when you have a depressed person who has a lot of anxiety, the answer is the same. So, yep, for sure, absolutely. There just isn't any limit to what your brain can do. Your brain can create all sorts of nasty physical symptoms, you know? There's no, there's just no end to, we see people that can't walk, we see people that can't talk, we see people that can't, they blind people, right? And then in three days later, they're better. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the cities, it's horrible. You know, when I see, you know, when I see kids coming out of grade 12 and, I, and they're going off to University in Edmonton or Calgary for three years, it's usually easier for me to keep seeing them and have them drive back and forth because half the time they won't get in to see a psychiatrist for a year and a half down there or two years. So I see them for three years and they come back with their degree. And so, yeah, but, you know, the waiting list in Calgary to see a psychiatrist is in excess of a year. To see a therapist is probably close to a year. If you go through their central, they have a central consolidated place in Calgary where you, everybody goes and then they pass you on to the first available therapist. And I think they're, you know, they try and prioritize you depending on what your needs are. But on average, you're looking at pretty nine to 12 months. But if you, in Red Deer, things are much better. If you went to the mental health clinic downtown and, and had a moderately urgent problem, they would probably see you and get you started in less than a month. And they have the ability to have you in there for your first session right within the same week, you know. And if you need something today, they'll... So Red Deer is pretty good, actually. When you look at waiting lists and what we have available, we do pretty well. So the, you know, to answer your question, the waiting lists aren't bad in Red Deer. Well, I don't, you know, it's always a big debate about, you know, are these things increasing in kids and in certain populations, or is it just that people are getting better at making the diagnosis, or kids are coming forward and identifying that they have problems earlier and therefore we find them earlier. So I don't know if it's more common. I would think that any sort of stress-related illness would be more common in young people these days than it was 100 years ago, you know, just because of the existence of stress, right? And in terms of, uh, there isn't any research or evidence anywhere to suggest that these medications have, you know, deleterious effects on the developing brain of a, of a neonate or of a young kid, right? So there's lots of studies around that stuff to, to show its safety profile. And some of the drugs that we used when I was a young guy and first started practicing were pretty scary drugs. I mean, they were very potent. They often did what you wanted, but, you know, you kind of worried about what kind of side effects you're really creating here. But, and the new ones seem to be pretty safe and the research, you know, there's always lots of research trying to establish safety because drug companies, before they can get their drug into your country, they not on, only have to show that to some standard it works better than sugar water, they also have to show a, a decent safety profile. So they do that in overdose and to the best they can, you know, asking people to report all and any side effects that have ever been noticed by anybody around the world, right? So they, they really keep pretty exhaustive databases and they try really hard to accumulate all that information, which isn't to say that they know everything they, there is to know, but so far there's no signals out there that these are scary drugs for developing brains in terms of causing unreverse, irreversible damage or something. Yeah, we try to, so what I would, if I had a pregnant woman who was on an antidepressant, um, we would try and taper her off and get that down to a very minimal dose before she delivered. If they don't, then the, the babies will have withdrawal and the pediatricians will often put them in the NICU or somewhere where they can watch them more closely. So they keep an eye on them. The pediatricians are very clear in saying, you know, they aren't particularly concerned about it. They don't, but they watch these kids. So certainly these kids are shaky. They don't sleep as well. Some, you know, it's like adults, some of them look more ill than others, others seem to be fine. All I really know is the pediatricians suggest that it's, it's not really a serious concern for the kids. But the moms don't like that and doctors don't like to cause that and so we try to avoid that. <laughs>
Yeah, we try really hard to avoid it. We, I mean, some, there's a lot of people, by the time they figure out they're pregnant, they've been on lithium for four months. And so the, the data, you know, it can cause serious problems with the developing child, but it's pretty, pretty uncommon, honestly. I've never seen it happen. But because it is known to happen rarely, we all try to avoid it. But every year we see people on lithium that get pregnant and they don't know they're pregnant until it's too late to worry about it. Well, we, you know, if uh, you know, we sit down with that person, we have a long talk about the risks and the advantages and disadvantages of staying on the drug and getting off the drug, and we make an informed decision. If they're scared to death of lithium, we manage with something safer. We take them off it and put them on something else.